Welcome to the fourth module of the Superhero Entertainments course. This is Superhero Resurgence. This is lesson 4.1, the first for this module. There are four lessons in this module. 4.1, The Flash, Julius Schwartz, Green Lantern, Justice League of America. 4.2, The Rebirth of Comic Book Superheroes, Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko. 4.3, Comic Book Superheroes Plus, Dracula, Kung Fu, and more, and 4.4, Superhero Apopogy, Crisis, Watchmen, and The Dark Knight Returns. In this lesson, I'll cover the first reconceptualization or rebooting of comic book superheroes. By the end of this lesson, you should have a good understanding of the 1950s as a time of social change, how superheroes could be reimagined for such a time, and the superhero as a team member. The Flash had been a relatively popular character in DC Comics from his introduction in January 1940, but his regular comic book was cancelled in February 1949 when the popularity of superheroes waned post-World World War II. In September 1956, DC relaunched the character in Showcase 4. In doing so, DC editor Julius Schwartz decided to reinvent the character rather than to just revive him. Previously, The Flash had been Jay Garrick, a college student who obtained his powers through hard water. Later, this was changed to heavy water. The new Flash was a police scientist who gained his powers through an accidental chemical bath. It is worth noting that both versions gained their power through a form of science. Just as I noted in Lesson 2.1, superheroes are a product of a belief in the power of science. This was the first instance of what we now call reboots, in which a character is revised or restarted. In The Flash's case, he was a different person with a different origin and costume than the original Flash. The Flash proved popular enough that in January 1959, he received his own comic book, continuing the numbering of issues from the previous 1940s version. This is our first key point. Rebooting characters dates from 1956. Julius Swartz is generally mentioned in histories of comic books as reintroducing The Flash and revitalizing superhero comics. His other contributions to superheroes are generally known, and of course he has a Wikipedia page. Swartz was one of the few comic book editors of long standing who did not move into a senior management position or onto other projects like television. While a figure like Stan Lee is the subject of much praise and indeed derision, Swartz is generally praised in muted tones and seldom subject to derision. And yet he had almost as large an impact on superhero entertainments as Lee. DC's website doesn't really tell you very much about Swartz. Swartz followed up the success of The Flash with reintroducing Green Lantern in Showcase 22 in September 1959, and in the years that followed, Hawkman and The Atom. Superheroes then had 10 to 11 years of popularity from 1938 through to 1949, and less than 10 years in the doldrums. Perhaps this upswing of superheroes may have only been a temporary renewed popularity, but Julius Swartz also reintroduced the concept of the superhero team, and I think thereby ensuring the longevity of superheroes. The Justice League of America first appeared in The Brave and the Bold, issue 28, March 1960. This team of DC superheroes included Wonder Woman, Flash, Green Lantern, Aquaman, The Martian Manhunter, with cameos from Superman and Batman. The team was so successful that by October 1960, they had their own comic book. The Justice League of America was a reworking of the 1940s team, the Justice Society of America. Why was the Justice League of America so popular? It could have been because comic fans like super teams. DC had another team, the Legion of Superheroes, which began in Adventure Comics 247, April 1958, and over the years had a loyal fan following as evidence from the letters to the editor. 
perhaps this fan following flowed over into the Justice League of America. Another factor might have been a trend in America that was quite strong in the 1950s, in which the notion that groups and organizations were better able to make decisions and operationalize them than individuals. This probably stemmed from people's experience during the Great Depression, when the federal government played an increasingly important and central role, in World War II, in which the mobilization of the United States as a whole for the war effort showed the power of a collective might, and from the number of large corporations that operated in a similar fashion to military organization, but at a lesser scale. These are possibilities and suggestions. In the 1950s, power both in the hands of government and corporations was more centralized than it had been previously. Critics of this, like William H. White, stress the need for greater awareness of the benefits of individual effort. This brings us to key point two. In some ways, superhero groups like the Justice League of America captured the feeling that groups were more effective than individuals. On the other hand, powerful superheroes like Superman fed into notion that powerful individuals could affect change. This brings us to another key point. Superheroes then in the 1950s captured two different and opposed aspects of American life. They embodied this tension and superhero teams and their popularity suggest that readers were looking for answers about how to deal with incredible powerful beings subject them to the control of a group, albeit a group of their peers. And just to be clear, I'm not saying that Julius Swartz and other editors at DC sat down and planned superhero groups to meet this need. Rather, he and DC may, and I note I say may, have tapped into a collective unconscious among readers. This lesson has three key points. Go back over your notes and the video of the lesson and make sure you have noted these points. Next up, lesson 4.2, Marvel and the Rebirth of Comic Book Superheroes, Stan Lee, Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko.